Good morning, beautiful people of God. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Kipling United Methodist Church on this Palm Sunday. It's a special day in the life of the church. We're so glad to have you. My name is Justin. I have the privilege of serving here as pastor. And we're so grateful that you're here, whether you're joining us in person or online. And our prayer is that on this Palm Sunday, as we launch into Holy Week, that you would encounter the grace of the living God revealed finally and fully in Jesus, his son, and that that love would move you closer to God's own heart. So welcome to worship this morning. We have several announcements for you. Uh, one is that we, we are bringing to close uh, our Wednesday worship services. This week will be the last Wednesday. I think we're going to take a break for Bible study. Uh, this will be the last week we do it for, a, for this mini Easter break, and then we're going to resume and do some for the rest of the spring. Uh, but we're going to take a couple weeks off from that. So be there this week as we look at Passover and we look at uh, actually all of history as finding its culmination in Jesus. That's this uh, Tuesday at 7, and then our worship uh, will, will be on Wednesday evening. Um, Monday and Thursday is 7 p.m. here. We will stream it online as well, so if you're not able to be here in person, that's okay. Uh, we, we will invite you to join us online for that. Uh, Easter sunrise is out at Olive Branch Cemetery at 645. We hope you'll join us for that. And then Easter worship next Sunday at 11 a.m. right here. We hope that you'll join us for that. The, the last item I have uh, is a big thank you for everybody who made possible the barbecue, from the folks who bought the meat to the folks who stayed up and cooked the meat to the folks who cleaned to the folks who sold to the folks who got signs up. Everybody, it, it takes a village, right, to make something like that happen, and we're so grateful uh, for everybody and grateful for our community members who supported us and supported the mission and ministry of the church by coming and buying some pork. So thank you all. Would you give yourself a round of applause? Thank you for that opportunity. Do we have any other announcements before we enter into a time of worship? Anything that I've forgotten about? Ray, did you want to say something this morning? I forgot what I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> That's okay. If, if, go ahead. I'll go ahead and say it. Come on. Okay. I'll go ahead. Can we turn the ball? You guys, will you be seated just for a moment? Yeah. yeah. Ray's got a word uh, for us that he wants to share. And then we'll enter into a call to worship and... Uh, kiddos, at this time, if you want to gather in the back, we will pass out palms to you, because that's coming next. Go on. Oh. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say was that uh, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be, I guess, uh, not a, don't have a Sunday school superintendent anymore, but I'm hey, concerned girl. about our Sunday school. We don't have a lot of people come to Sunday school. I know by now that the people here, the old people on here, there, but maybe somebody in the recording will see it and understand we need to, to come and study about the word of God. So this is what it's about, it's about the word of God. And I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of our pastor that he preaches the word of God. And that's why I, I, I'm so glad we have a man that does that. But I think that's a very important thing that we take time out to study the Word of God. We have plenty of room in the class that I have, not, not because I'm a teacher, but I enjoy teaching, but because we have a, a, a time to study the Word, and we're glad to have you there, that you can come out a little bit early. And I just want to say that kids the same way. Uh, I was brought up, <laughs> I was in Sunday school. We had a big Sunday school. And I would love to see Sunday school Back up again. I know we live in a time when we just say, well, you know, one hour is all I can afford. But I hope that that's not it. I hope you take some time during the week to read the Bible. I hope you take time during the week to think about God, not just one hour that we're here. That's all I got to say about that. Amen. Thank you, Ray. Thanks for sharing your heart. We appreciate you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an invitation. I know that many of you uh, feel like he's preaching to the choir because you're here. If you're not able to join us for Sunday school, that's, that's totally all right. If you, if you don't feel safe yet, that's okay. But are there other ways that you can engage, whether that's on Tuesday night Bible study or joining somebody else for an online Bible study or just reading the scripture from that week uh, in, in, the, in your own home? Uh, because I think as, as Christians who bear the name of the little Christ, we're, we're meant to reflect the glory of our mentor. We're meant to shine and share the love of Jesus by the way that we live. And if you want to know what that looks like, you have to get into the scriptures. You have to look at the Jesus 
that scripture is revealed. And so uh, thank you, Ray, for that word to us about how do we do that? And can we do that through Sunday school? Can we do that through other means? That's an important word. Well, uh, this morning it is Palm Sunday. I'm actually going to stand with me as you're able. Our kids are getting ready. They're so excited to, to come in and wave some palm branches and remind us of this day. Uh, they're, they're going to be shouting Hosanna, which is part of our call to worship. Hosanna is a Hebrew word. That means save us, Savior. Will you say Hosanna with me? Save Hosanna. Us. Hosanna means Hosanna. save us, Savior. And as Jesus entered Jerusalem, that's what the people were crying out. Hosanna. Save us, Savior. It was a title that they reserved for the king. Save us, Savior. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest, they would shout. And they wanted the king to know that they, the king had the power to save them. And so would you, would you save us? Would you rescue us from our lowly estate? Would you deliver us from the hands of our enemies? Hosanna. And so as Jesus entered Jerusalem in the last week of his life, uh, this is what the people shouted, and, and they wanted him to save them. And so may we all catch a glimpse of what it means to call Jesus our Hosanna, to cry out, save us, Savior. Would you join me in a call to worship? Hosanna! Blessed is the Lord who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is God's coming kingdom. Hosanna! Save us, Lord Christ. Hosanna in the highest. Come and worship Christ who leads us into life. Children, we invite you to line up and lead us in the shouts of Hosanna as we listen to our opening hymn. Amen. Would you please be seated? And Shelby's going to come up and lead us in some prayer. We also, especially this week, 
um, pray for the victims of violence in Colorado and in Atlanta as we have had um, two mass shootings in this country um, in just a couple of weeks. And we pray for everyone who, um, the families of those who were killed and just for that, the whole community um, that's been affected um, by, by these tragedies in Colorado and Boulder um, in, in Atlanta. Within this church community, we also have a few um, prayer requests and praises to lift up today. Um, Kathy Bradley, um, uh, we pray for her. The hospice nurse has said that Kathy is in her final days, and so we want to pray for um, her family as um, they make this transition and um, just pray for peace and um, as, they, as they spend this sacred time with her in these last days. We also um, lift up Mike Jackson, Jill's brother. Um, there's some good news there because as of yesterday, um, the breathing tube was removed and he is breathing on his own. And so we praise God for that. That is a celebration. Um, but he still has a road ahead of him. And so um, we just continue to pray for his healing and transformation as he, um, once, it's, once he's stable enough, they'll restart chemo treatments for him. And so. Yes, Jill, we pray for Mike, and we are all lifting Mike up in prayer. We praise God for um, the good news from yesterday. Let's see, Jan Hadding, um, who is an Emmaus pilgrim, um, she passed away this week from COVID complications. And so um, we pray for her family and friends, and that's just another reminder that, you know, even as we're moving forward and things are getting better, um, people are still suffering losses um, from this pandemic. And finally, we pray for Danny Brown and for Wanda and for their family. Um, that's why, as you probably noticed, Wanda is not able to be here this morning because Danny was admitted to the hospital again with pneumonia um, and some other issues yesterday. Um, and then also his mother, Jane Brown, so Wanda's mother-in-law, um, was also hospitalized this week with a leg infection. She's doing better and hopefully will be released soon, but we just pray for Wanda and for that whole family as they're going through multiple things with multiple family members right now. And now, would you go to our God with me in prayer? God of transformation, we are reminded this day that Jesus' ride into Jerusalem was more than a show. It was a signal that things are changing. A message to the powers that be that the world as we know it is becoming the world as it should be. It was a radical act of defiance against those in Jesus' day who wielded power through violence, oppression, and tyranny. It is no less radical and no less tame for those who do the same today. This simple ride into Jerusalem on a donkey reminds us and tells the whole world that you are indeed coming to make all things new. You are coming to turn weapons of war into instruments of peace. You are coming to release those who find themselves in all types of bondage, chains of injustice, chains of addiction and illness, chains of pressure and apathy. You are coming to provide for the poor, food for the hungry and shelter for the homeless. You are coming to assure the dignity and equality of all who are marginalized and oppressed. You are coming to end violence and division, to provide safe communities and opportunities for education. You are coming to offer healing and wholeness, comfort, consolation, and hope. You are coming to transform all that we know. You are coming to save us. But like humble Jesus riding into town on a lowly donkey, you are coming in a grand fashion. You are coming with thunder and lightning. You aren't making an epic entrance. You're coming through the mystery of love incarnate, through your church, this church, empowered by your spirit, through lives transformed and inspired, through ordinary people like us blessed by you to do extraordinary things. Come, gracious God, into a world that longs for change, a world that needs your love, a world full of your own children, a world bright with hope and potential. Blessed are those who come in your name, O God. 
We have come, and we will go. And now we pray. We pray for your coming kingdom, emerging all around us, using the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now I invite the children to come forward for a moment. I'm going to come down there and share a message with you.
Just like you entered Jerusalem, we ask you humbly to enter our hearts, to enter our hearts and fill us with your love and peace and joy. It's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. every Sunday in the season of Lent has been confession and pardon. Uh, and this is uh, the not-so-good news, right? That we're sinners who strayed from God's way. We've heard this through each of the sermons and through each of the passages of Scripture we've read through Lent. Now, the human response to God's love and grace and God's command is to stray, to err, to go our own way. Here's the good news, right? That God doesn't leave us to our own devices. That God hasn't abandoned us, but God has been faithful. And God has made a way to be reconciled with humanity in Christ Jesus. And so it's with confidence that we come together and we join our voices together, confessing our sin and also receiving the abundant grace that God has to offer. Would you join me in the prayer of confession today? Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The key to the whole prayer. Can we go back one slide, Dan? I'm going to make you do some, uh, some uh, I don't know, calisthenics. Some, some, uh, yeah, there you go. Did you get Oh, it's called. Uh, Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the faithful one. Jesus is our forgiveness and sin. Jesus is our faithful response to God's grace. So, uh, can we go to the next slide now? Hear the good news, sisters and brothers, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And this proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. forgiven. In the name, in the name of, of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I love that time because it's a time where I get to be reminded too that I'm a recipient of grace, that I'm forgiven just as you have been forgiven. So thanks be to God. Uh, the song of preparation is a uh, great song for Holy Week. Palm Sunday leads us into Holy Week, points us to the cross of Christ, uh, and then also towards the anticipation we have of Easter Sunday, but there's this long process that we go through. And so this song is called How Deep the Father's Love. And as we think about uh, Palm Sunday and the events of Holy Week, may the love of God uh, stir you and move you.
All God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. Good morning. How y'all doing? Right. Y'all as tired as I am after the barbecue? Yeah, I see some heads not. Good to have you with us. If you fall asleep, you've got a good excuse. Uh, it won't just be because it's boring up here. We're doing something else. Uh, if you have your Bibles, grab it and turn with me to the book of Mark. If you've got your smartphone, you can use that and uh, pull up your Bible app. The book of Mark, chapter 11, is where we're going to be today. Uh, this is uh, everything that we've encountered and experienced today. This is Jesus entering Jerusalem. That's what we're going to hear. We've been in this sermon series throughout the entirety of Lent about uh, the covenants that God makes. And there's a singular word that ties these covenants together. Do you remember the word? Chesed. 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 Everybody say it with me. Chesed. Chesed. Anybody have the tattoo yet? I'm looking at you. Not yet? Okay. I'm waiting. Chesed. Chesed is God's covenantal love. It's God's faithfulness. It's grace. It's mercy. It's forgiveness. It's fidelity. All rolled into one. And we've, we've looked at each of the covenants, five major covenants that God made with uh, Noah and Abraham and Moses and David. And now through Jeremiah, the promised new covenant. And so today uh, we're, we're taking this entire journey through all of those covenants and it reaches its climax in the person of Jesus, in his incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection. And so uh, we're reading from uh, Mark 11, but we're actually going to be looking forward all the way to the cross, all the way through Friday, all the way to Jesus' death. And so as we come on this and gather this Palm Sunday, uh, just a, a little a little uh, foreshadowing, we're going to be looking towards the cross of Christ on Good Friday. And why do we call it good in the first place? And, and uh, if you like this sermon, or even if you don't, you should come back Thursday. Thursday, we're, we're diving into Jesus as Passover lamb. We're looking very specifically at Jesus' Passover and, and what that means for us and what it meant uh, for the first uh, Jews that heard this, his disciples, and all the things that were going on for him. So that's the journey we're going on today. Uh, we're going to begin here with the book of Mark. So may you be blessed as you give attention to the reading and the hearing of God's word. When they were appro approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden, and tell you, Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Why are you stealing something? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat upon it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields, the palm branches. Then they who went ahead, and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna. Will you shout it with me? Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna, shout it again. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Then they entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when they had looked around at everything, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Hosanna, the people shouted. Save us, Savior. What does it mean to call Jesus Hosanna? What does it mean to ask him to save us from our sins, from oppression, from death? Would you join me in a word of prayer as we dive into this word? Good and gracious God, you are always more ready to speak to us than we are to listen. You're always more ready to forgive us than we are to confess. You're always more ready to pull us out of our graves and into abundant life than we are to receive. And yet today we're here and we're ready. And we ask that you speak. For your servants are listening. Open our eyes that we might see you in the pages of Scripture from the beginning to the end. Open our ears that we might hear the voice of Jesus, our Savior, calling our name. Open our hearts that we might make room for the new abundant life that he's brought us. And then open our hands that we might share it with the world. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, the risen and reigning Lord, our King. All God's people said? Amen. 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 All right, one more time with me. We say Hesed. 
That's it. And one more time, we say Hosanna. Okay. Hosanna, save us, Savior. Okay, I want you uh, to picture with me just for a second that you're sitting on this beach. Isn't this a wonderful place to be? This is in Hawaii. Uh, who would want to be there right now? Anybody else? Yes, absolutely. Amen. God, can you just, uh, is, is trans, you know, can we be transported there magically, mystically? Do some Star Trek stuff and go. It's wonderful. <laughs> so imagine with me, you're sitting at the, at, the, at the beach here. You see this mountain behind you. You're just enjoying a wonderful day at the beach. Uh, maybe you know what you're looking at. Maybe you don't. If you turn around, so here's the water, here's the beach. If you turn around and you're looking at the mountain, there, this is Mount Mauna Kea. Will you say that with me? Mount That's Mauna Kea. Mount Mauna Kea is, uh, is a volcano. It's actually the world's largest mountain. Did you know that? I thought it was Mount Everest, like up until uh, this week as I was preparing for this sermon. Mount Everest is something like 8,600 uh, uh, meters high. It's, it's the tallest uh, mountain that we have, right? Except for uh, that Mount Mauna Kea is about 3,000 meters taller than Mount Everest. You wouldn't know it by looking at it. I mean, it's a tall mountain in and of itself. But in order to see uh, the beauty of its grandeur, you know what you have to do? You got to put on some snorkel gear and you got to jump in the water. And as you dive into that beautiful Hawaiian water and, and you go down and you begin to explore the depths, you realize that there's tons. There's, there's more visible below the surface than above it. And not only that, but it's connected with a series of mountain ranges that give birth to the Hawaiian Islands. So Mount Mauna Kea isn't a mountain that stands alone, but it's a mountain that's part of a chain of mountains in the Pacific Islands, and it is the highest peak thereof. In fact, it's the highest mountain in the world. There you go. You didn't know that, did you? I didn't even tell this week. Maybe you did. You're smarter than me. Uh, as I was preparing for this Palm Sunday sermon, I was thinking about the mountain of Calvary. And I was thinking about how high that mountain stands, the, the mountain that Jesus climbed to, to heal the divide that separated us and God, us and our brothers and sisters in humanity, us and the good creation. Uh, the heights that Christ Jesus ascended to, carrying the cross on our behalf and in our place. And as I thought about that, I thought about how much was going on just below the surface. We've been in this series looking at the covenants, and we've been looking at these mountains that the scripture has pointed out to us along the way, these five covenants that God has made. Uh, and, and we've seen Mount Sinai. Uh, we didn't read the passage of Mount Moriah, but that's the story of Abraham and his son Isaac. And there are these other literal mountains on the journey that lead us to Calvary. But in order to understand the complexity and the beauty of the mountain of Calvary, you have to dive in and explore its depths. You have to get into the water. You have to wade deeply. And then you see that there's so much more going on below the surface than you ever imagined. And as you begin to explore, you realize that this one event is, is not just singular, but it's actually a chain of a lot of events that lead us back to the very beginning of the scriptures. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the, the cross of Jesus, where uh, the fullest and final revelation of God is, is given to humanity, and we're going to tie it in to the rest of scripture. So I'm hoping that this isn't uh, an all-day affair, but it could be. Y'all ready? Did you bring some food, maybe some snacks in a purse or something? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can fly through this, but I want us to, to look back from the very beginning of the scriptures and tie in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus uh, to these and see how Jesus is Jewish. Jesus was firmly cemented into the Jewish context. And, and as we explore not only the covenants, but the Old Testament scriptures that would have been Jesus' scriptures, that would have been the scriptures of the early church, they had no New Testament then, right? Uh, we see so much beauty and depth and grandeur there that's left to be unpacked that teaches us about Jesus. So not only does the Old Testament point us to the New Testament, point us to Jesus, but you know what Jesus does? He points us back to the Old Testament and says, this is what God was really doing from the beginning. And so we need both of these. And my wife is so great at this. You know, she loves the Old Testament. 
uh, before she, I met her, I was probably in love with the New Testament, especially the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Luke. I love Paul and his writing. And uh, she's been good about saying, okay, okay. But did you know there's a whole depth and beauty to this that preceded the New Testament? Well, yes, of course I did. But once you begin to unpack Jesus in all of his life, you get to see how he's pointing us back to the Old Testament. So I ran across this, uh, this quote this week as I was preparing for the sermon. This is from Tertullian, one of the, uh, the third century saints. He said, God brought forth the word as a root brings forth a shoot, a spring, the river, and the sun its beams. This is, of course, Tertullian pointing us to Jesus and saying, Jesus is unique and distinct as the Son of God. In fact, as, as God brings forth the word, it's, it's like as a sun bears its beams. The essence of the Father and the essence of the Son are the same. They're one and the same. In fact, if you've seen Jesus, you've seen who? You've seen his father. He says, I can only do what I see my father doing. This is the heartbeat of God. When we look to the face of Jesus, we see the heartbeat of God. And so uh, a lot of times I hear folks say, man, you know, I love Jesus. I love uh, the, the father that Jesus talks about. But when I read the Old Testament, I kind of get mired in the violence. I get mired in, in all of the brutality and the killings and the sacrifice. I get mired in the image of God that's proclaimed there. Well, here's what I want y'all to hear. If that's who you are, that's okay. There's many of Christians who've wrestled with this throughout the centuries. But here's the point. Jesus is the fullest and final revelation of God the Father. Jesus flows from God as a river from a spring. And so when you see Jesus, you've seen God. And as we look at Jesus, he points us back and says, this is how you're supposed to understand the whole of the scriptures. So we actually, as Christians, we say we start from the end. We start from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to look back and we're going to uncover the God that Jesus reveals who's, who's present and consistent. And I hope that you've heard that through this sermon series. That God is faithful. God is loving. God is merciful. And the full expression of this fidelity and love and mercy is Jesus the Son. Uh, and it's been constant through this series. So there's a phrase on, uh, on Passover, um, on the evening of Passover, that the, the Jewish community uses a prayer called the Deyenu. The Deyenu liturgy, uh, they walk through these events from Exodus, and they say, if God had only done this, it would have been enough. If God had only delivered us from Egypt, but not punished the Egyptians for their sins and oppression, it would have been enough. If God had led us through the Red Sea, but not into the promised land, it would have been enough, right? And so we're going to adapt this phrase today. And we're going to, it's going to be like we're going to the black church this morning. Can I get an amen? Because as I'm up here talking, y'all are going to be talking too, amen? So if you get some shouts or something else, it'd be wonderful in there, some amen, some preach, anything like that. But periodically I'm going to say, if God had only done this in Christ Jesus, and y'all are going to say, it would have been, been enough for us. We're going we're gonna to lift up the voice of the, the Israelite people uh, for Passover, and we're going we're gonna to bring it into its fullness. So if God had only done this in Christ Jesus, it would have been, been, been enough for us. Amen. We should just stop right there, right? <laughs> so we've been looking at these covenants, and we started with Noah, but I'm going to back this up to the very beginning. The opening pages of Scripture, humanity is created in the image of God. God envisions a partnership, a loving relationship between God and the creatures that God has made. And he says, listen, uh, every tree in the garden is for you and for your benefit. But of that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Now, if you've ever had a, ch a child and you've been in the kitchen and you said, hey, um, I'm going to give you some cookies once this is done. They're all going to go into that cookie jar, but you can't have them until I'm done baking. And then you have to go to the restroom. What happens? What are the kids going to be doing? Gone. All you parents, yes, the first thing that they're going to do, because it's top of mind awareness, you just told them not to do it, they're going to do exactly what you told them not to do. And so they, they're going to find a way to get to the, the top of the refrigerator, wherever you got the cookie jar, and they're going to get in it. And when you get out, you're going to say, what did you just do? You just did the thing that I told you not to do. 
And there's a lot of similarities that we see there in, in the story of Adam and Eve. All of this is yours. All of this good creation. Everything in this garden. All of the beauty of the earth. It's created for you. It's, it's intended for your flourishing and for your well-being. Did you see that tree over there? From that tree you shall not eat or you will surely die. die. Now, as you read that passage and you think, well, Adam and Eve did eat it and they didn't die, right? Like, they, they didn't physically cease from being, you might think, well, is God a liar? What's going on there? Well, I think part of what's going on is that God is the life source. God is the fountain of all life. And when we listen, when we're obedient to the one who knows us and knows what's best for us and created us in, in that image, then everything goes well. But when we stray, uh, then somehow, somewhere we're, we're cut off from the life that was meant to flow. And so, Physical death, maybe not, but spiritual death, being cut off from the source of their being, yes, that's precisely what happened, and they're hiding from it. So uh, the scripture talks about Jesus as the new Adam. It says that Jesus, and Paul picks up this theme and everything else, we start at one tree in the garden, and, and the journey ends with another tree in another garden. And one tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that leads to death. And the other tree, the cross of Christ, is one that leads to everlasting life. And so Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus is God's son. The scripture says that all of Israel is, is a child of God. They're children of God. But there's something distinct about this Jesus. He's utterly unique. He's born of Mary. He's human, fully human. But he's also born of the Holy Spirit. And so there's this... There's this union in Jesus of humanity and the divine work. And they've, they've been united in Jesus. And Jesus is a new Adam. And where the first Adam strayed and couldn't keep the command, Jesus is faithful. Jesus is faithful. The passage that shall be read from Philippians. Jesus is obedient God, to God even unto death. death. Even death on the cross, Paul says. Jesus will be faithful where the first human beings were faithless. Jesus is going to be this recapitulation, this reliving of all of the covenants, of all of the characters. Jesus is going to take them into his life. So Jesus is the new Adam. And here's where you guys get to join in. If God had only done this in Christ Jesus, it would have been us. If Jesus let it, if, if God had only led us from the tree of death to the tree of life, it would have been enough. But that's not all that God did in Christ Jesus. The story of Jesus continues. Uh, the story of Noah, we looked at it a couple weeks ago, the beginning of Lent, and we talked about how as God looks at humanity, uh, violence was the modus operandi of the human heart. The human heart was only evil continually. And when God looked at his good creation that was meant for flourishing and thriving, he saw wickedness. He saw violence. He saw oppression. He saw injustice. He saw death. And, and the scripture says that God is grieved by this. And so what will God do about this? Right? We have God's promise to Noah that never again will he restore, reconcile, and redeem humanity through the violence of the flood. So in Christ Jesus, we have the way that God has said, this is how I'm going to make all the wrongs right. This is the way that I'm going to undo evil, sin, and death, and violence, and oppression, and injustice. This is the way that it's going to be. Now, as we hear these words, we've been through 10 days of literal hell, where we've heard about our human family inflicting violence upon itself in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Boulder, Colorado. And many of us are saying, how long, O oh Lord? How long until we figure this out, that we are in this together, that we are all united, that we are all brothers and sisters, that we are all one in Christ Jesus, our Lord? How long, O oh Lord? The cross of Jesus is the end of violence. And I mean that in the literal sense. It's... It's the, the final pointing. This is, this is what all violence points to. It points to humanity pushing God as far as we can get God. 
God comes to us in love, in mercy, in forgiveness, in, in the desire to reconcile and redeem humanity. And you know what humanity did? We pushed God as far as we could possibly push God. All the way outside of the city of Jerusalem, all the way to the cross of Christ. And we said, God, we don't want any of your forgiveness. We don't want any of your reconciliation. We don't want any of your redemption. We're in love with our violent ways. That's the story of humanity. We love violence more than we love God. We love violence more than we love each other. We love violence more than we do the good creation. But not only is the cross where violence leads us, the cross is actually the undoing of violence. God tries to undo violence with, with Noah and with the flood. That doesn't work. God tries covenant partnership with Abraham. That doesn't work. God tries covenant partnership with Israel. That doesn't work. God tries uh, the king, David, and tries to undo violence. None of it works. And so God says, you know what's going to happen? I am going to come and I am going to receive all of their hatred, all of their oppression, all of their injustice, all of their violence, I'm going to take it onto myself, my very being, in my son, Jesus Christ. Because the only way to undo all of this hatred and violence and death and injustice and oppression is to receive it and to forgive it. And so Jesus on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Jesus is the new Noah. Not only is he the faithful one who's going to make the way to the salvation of all the world, but Jesus is going to take upon him his very self, his very being, all of our hatred, all of our violence, all of our oppression. And so this kingdom that Jesus brings is already and not yet, right? This is the end of violence, and we still live in a violent world. But as Christians, this is what we're pointing people to. Violence isn't the way of the kingdom. Violence isn't the way of Jesus. We know where violence ends up. It ends up at the crucifixion of the God who loves us. And so Jesus shows us another way. So here's where you guys get to join me again. If God had only done this in Christ Jesus, it would have been enough for us. It would have been enough for us. If only the cross of Christ was the undoing of the violence and injustice and oppression, it would have been enough. But that's not the end. That's just one mountain upon the many mountains that lead us to the hill of Calvary. Uh, we heard about the story of Abraham, and we heard about how God says, okay, I don't know how to get through to these people, but maybe I'll just choose one family in all of the earth. And through the choosing of that family, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Abraham, you have been blessed so that you might be a blessing to everybody. And Jesus is the new Abraham. You see, Jesus is invited to be God's covenant partner. And Abraham, uh, Abraham is, is considered righteous because of what? Because of faith. Everybody say the word faith with me. Faith. faith. Because he trusts God. You remember the story, Abraham is barren. His wife Sarah is barren. His name means father of many, and he has no children. And so it's into that barrenness that God speaks the promise of resurrection. And he says, Abraham, if you will just trust me, I will lead you from death to new life. Abraham, if you just trust me, I will make you the father of many nations. The barren one will be the blessed one, and all of the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Does this sound familiar? This is Jesus. Jesus is the faithful covenant partner. Jesus is the one who trusts God on our behalf and in our place. When we are faithless, guess who's faithful? Jesus. When we can't believe, guess who believes on our behalf? Jesus. When we doubt, guess who believes? Jesus. And so Jesus is the faithful covenant partner. Jesus is the one who trusts God even to the end. Jesus is the one who's going to be obedient even unto the cross. And it's all so that through him all of the families of the earth will be blessed. And so in Jesus you have the blessing not just of the people of Israel, not just of the family of Abraham, but who? The world. 
For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Jesus came not to condemn the world, but in order to save, save the world. And if there was ever a word that needed to be heard, it's that one. That in Jesus, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection, we don't have the condemnation of sin alone, but we have the invitation into new and abundant life. He came to save us, not condemn us. And so in Christ Jesus, you have at once God's no to evil, sin, and death, and God's yes to humanity. We see in Christ that God loves us more than he loves himself. So, uh, oh, here we go. This, this is part of what we're getting at. Will you guys read this with me? Jesus both reveals God's heart and embodies faithful human response to God's love. Remember that, that the line a couple, a couple of minutes ago, talking about Jesus fully human, born of the Virgin Mary, and Jesus fully divine, born of the Holy Spirit. Why is that so important? Well, not only is Jesus the full revelation of who God is, not only when we see Jesus face to face do we see the face of God, but Jesus is also the faithful human partner. In Jesus, we have both God's love and faithful human response all wrapped into one. How is God going to make this right? Well, it's through Jesus. Humanity kept breaking covenant, so what did God do? God said, I will keep covenant on your behalf. I'm going to send one who's going to be representative and bless the entirety of the world. So that's what we have in Jesus. So if God had only done this in Christ Jesus, it would have been enough for us. It would have been enough for us. All the nations of the earth would have been blessed through his trusting in God. But it's got to stop there. No. No, we get to Moses and we get to the people of Israel oppressed in Egypt and crying out for deliverance. And God sends Moses the deliverer, right? But Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the new liberator of God's people. And what God says is, listen, I know that you're oppressed. I know that you're, you are, are dealing with the oppression of these brutal taskmasters in Egypt. So I'm going to send one who will deliver you and free you from oppression and slavery and injustice. Well, in Christ Jesus, not only do we have freedom from oppression and injustice, but we have free, freedom from evil, sin, and death. You know what Paul says the wages of sin is? Death. You know what the real problem of sin is? The corruption of the good creation that leads everything into death. And so Jesus, as the new Mo Moses, the one who's lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness, as Jesus is lifted up on the cross of Christ, he, he receives all of the death that humanity had engendered by straying from God's command and path, by by oppressing others, by being people of injustice. Yeah, Jesus takes all of that upon himself. He takes our death and he exchanges that death for new and abundant life. Jesus is the new Moses. We're going to get into this on Thursday. So if you want to hear more about Jesus as Passover lamb, and Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and the sprinkling of the blood, and what the cup means, and what the bread means, and what communion is all about, then come Thursday, okay? So there's a little teaser. So if Jesus, if God had only done this in Christ Jesus, it would have been, 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 been enough for us. In Jesus Christ, we are moved from death and from oppression and from slavery to sin and from slavery to death into freedom and into new and abundant life. And if that's all that God had done, it would have been enough in Christ Jesus. You have to come back for, uh, for that on Wednesday. Finally, we get to David. And in David, we see the cycle of the judges end and the people cry out for a king. And so God says, finally, yes, I will give you a king. And he gives them a king that they don't expect. It's not the oldest of the sons of Jesse, but it's the youngest. It's the runt. It's the one who's overwatching the fields, right? And this is, this is God pointing us to the, the type of king that Jesus will be. He will be a king, and he will be a Messiah, and he will save the people from their sins. But he's going to be a king that's different than anything Israel has ever experienced or expected. A king in the line of David. 
And so what, what, is, what is it that Jesus wears for a crown? Thorns. Thorns. Humanity mocks him. He's due a golden crown. He's due all of our jewels, all of our praise, everything that we could adore him with. And yet what do we give him? Crown thorns. Jesus is the suffering servant that Isaiah teaches about. Jesus is the one who will suffer. He's the king who will free their people, who will lead them through deliverance, but who will do it by suffering on their behalf and in their place. And then the color of the king is what? Purple. And it's purple because purple was a really hard color to get. In fact, there are like these crustaceans in the Mediterranean that they have to, they have to pop, and as they pop them, this purple pigment comes out of them. And so it's, it's, it's risky to get down into the water to get them. It, you only have a little bit that comes out. So purple is the color of kings for a bunch of different reasons, right? Purple is the color of lint. We have it all over the sanctuary. As Jesus is going to the cross, what do they throw over him? A purple garment. They say, here you are, king of the Jews, crown of thorns, purple garment. This is the one who said he was the, the healer of the nations. Will you heal yourself? Right? And so Jesus, as the Messiah, as the one who will save us from our sins, is a different king than we anticipate. He's not one that leads triumphantly on a white war horse and, and the battles or the, the armies uh, of legions of, of angels and people follow after him to conquer the kings of the earth. Jesus is the king who is only exalted on the cross. It's his suffering and death that actually undo all of the powers in the world. We learn in Jesus that there's a power at work in the world that's greater than violence, that's greater than force, that's greater than hatred. It's love. It's the suffering love of a God who loves us more than he loves himself. And so, if this was all that God had done in Christ Jesus, it would have been enough for us. Of course, this isn't all that Christ has done for us. I hope that as you hear the story of the scripture told, as you look back through the arc of the people of Israel that culminates in the cross of Christ Jesus, you see this clearly. God loves you. And there's nothing you can do. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more. And there's nothing that you can do to make God love you any less. Jesus is the face of the God who loves you. And so as we enter into this Holy Week on Palm Sunday, I want you to sit with this Jesus. I want you to sit with the crucified. I want you to set with a king who makes room for all to enter into his kingdom. Through forgiveness, through mercy, through love. Because if you set with that Jesus, something happens. If you reflect on his life and on his death, Something within you begins to soften. And you believe if, if that's the depth of God's love for me, then maybe that's a God worth loving after. Maybe that's a God worthy of my Maybe so. In the name of the Father and the Son. Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Amen. 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 If God had only done this in Christ Jesus, it would have been enough for us. In fact, it was enough to reconcile, restore, and redeem. Thanks be to God.
want you to stand with me. And uh, we've been journeying through this whole service from Pope shouting Hosanna as Jesus enters uh, Jerusalem and, and we've journeyed with him to the cross. And so now we get to proclaim together, lift high the cross. And as we listen to this uh, song, may this be the prayer of your heart as, as we carry out with us like a banner, the cross of Christ, the love of God poured out for all to see. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you leave, we want you to give your offerings with you as you go. A reminder that a reminder that our offerings are uh, a reflection of the grace that God has given to us. All of life is a gift, and so we're going to give in response to that. And as you leave, uh, may you lift high the cross. May you know that God loves you this much and prays for you that you might be forgiven and reconciled and redeemed. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. All God's people said? Amen. Amen.